Evening from Philadelphia, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Dave Malter. I am the Director of Enrollment Management and Marketing and Director of the Masters in Camp Administration and Leadership here at Gratz College. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as most of our graduate programs and other programs that we do, we have huge representation from all across the country. Uh, we have over 25 states represented. So wherever you're coming from, hello. Uh, we're also a very special welcome to those international participants from Israel, Canada, Norway, and South Korea. We're excited to be able to offer this important type of programming to our whole Gratz community. Whether you're a returning member of that community or a new member of that community, we welcome you. And we're looking forward to learning more about using mouse in the classroom and the conversation that will come from this learning. Uh, for those of you who are new to Gratz College, we were formally founded in 1895 as the first independent college of Jewish studies in North America. And the tradition started by the Gratz family continues today with our commitment to quality education and the Jewish community. Uh, we were pioneers in online learning having first offered virtual classes 20 years ago, and we continue to innovate uh, the way we deliver our programs. I'd like to speak for a minute just about uh, the Center for Holocaust Studies and Human Rights, which we formed just about a year ago. I'm gonna put the link in the chat if you'd like more information, but just to give you a little bit more information, um, the center is composed of three graduate programs which work collaboratively to prepare students for confronting the universal problems from a variety of perspectives. So we have our Holocaust and Genocide Studies program, where we offer a graduate certificate, an MA, and a PhD. Uh, our Human Rights program, which is one of our newer programs, uh, where we also have a graduate certificate and an MA, as well as the Interfaith Leadership Program, uh, where we have several graduate certificates including a certificate in chaplaincy through a partnership with Hartford Seminary, as well as an MA in interfaith leadership. Uh, students can concentrate in one program in the center, or they can choose to combine these programs as part of their graduate study. Uh, in addition, students may incorporate course, coursework from our other programs at Gratz, including education or nonprofit management, if they wanna focus on teaching in those areas, or wish to work for a museum, a human rights institute, or an interfaith organization. Uh, the center also offers lectures and webinars for the general public, much like tonight, uh, as well as broader topics built on the center's overarching concern to address and hopefully someday end the human problems of hatred, bigotry, religious intolerance, inequality, and violence. So with that, uh, tonight we're going to be discussing how to teach mouse in the classroom. And we hope that you will participate and be an active part of the conversation. We are recording this event and only myself and our presenter, Dr. Gary Weissman will be visible on that recording. So you can feel free to leave your cameras on. You will not be part of that recording, but you will be able to see it yourselves as we go through tonight's program. Uh, there are going to be many opportunities to contribute and we hope that you will. The chat will be open all evening and I will do my best to make sure that any questions put into the chat are answered. If you do have a question, you can either raise your hand and I'll do my best to get to you or put the question in the chat and I'll make sure to monitor that. Um, if there's something you're still left wondering about at the end of the night, we will make sure to get those questions answered for you. With all that out of the way, I'd like to introduce Dr. Gary Weissman, who will be leading our conversation for tonight. Uh, Gary spoke to us last year about teaching mouse, and we are grateful that he agreed to come back and once again take another look at bringing the power of mouse to the classroom. Uh, a little bit about Gary, in addition to being an adjunct faculty here at Gratz College, which we're very appreciative of, he uh, is the Associate Professor of English at the University of Cincinnati. He teaches courses in literary studies and film studies, including seminars on Holocaust testimony. So I won't tell you too much more. I'm sure he'll share more about himself. We're very excited to have him here and I will let him take it away. And again, thank you for being here. Gary. Hey, thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who took uh, the time to come tonight and participate in what should be a lively discussion. I will, um, talk a little bit about um, where I see uh, the 
the banning of of mouse um, within kind of what's going on culturally, but most of, of what I'll be talking about are uh, issues related to teaching mouse. And so one of the, or maybe the only the only good side of mouse uh, being removed um, from the curriculum of um, schools in a district of Tennessee is that it, it, it's kind of renewed interest in mouse. And I, for instance, and, and some of my colleagues who were not necessarily planning on teaching mouse um, are now adding mouse to, to our college courses. So I should say I teach college, but I'll be um, talking about um, approaches to mouse that would work um, at secondary level. So, um, and also I'd like to thank Gratz for um, having this um, event and inviting me to be part of it. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, so um, yeah, so I'll talk for a little bit, then um, I'll have an activity for, for us to do, which involves like applying what I've spoken about to a page from Mouse, and then we will discuss that and then move to just more open questions. So again, uh, the occasion for this is obviously that a school board in Tennessee banned or removed mass from its curriculum. Before um, saying much else, I just want to point out that um, that Mouse is not a graphic novel. It gets called a graphic novel all the time, basically because um, comics were not considered worthy of serious study until they were published in book form. Um, and those were fictional works. And so graphic novel became the genre name for that. And we kind of automatically go to it. So it's important to just emphasize that Mouse isn't a novel or a graphic novel, but a uh, graphic memoir, or I call it, would call a graphic narrative, because it's in a complicated way, it, it incorporates um, a, a survivor account within um, Art story, Art Spiegelman's story. So I think a noteworthy thing is that when uh, the banning of mouse was reported, uh, very few mainstream outlets connect, you know, also said, hey, by the way, Toni Morrison's Bluest Eye was also banned this week by school districts. And in fact, um, well, let me, it, this is part of a very long uh, standing uh, movement of book banning that has become uh, astronomically greater since 2021. And so, in November of, um, of 2012, I'm sorry, in November 12th, two months before Mouse was removed, Michelle Goldberg in an op-ed in the New York Times was reporting on this frenzy of book banning. Um, books being removed due to sexually explicit material. And um, in that op-ed she quotes, a, a director uh, of the American Library Association who talks about how um, there's always been a book banning, but that it's become um, in much greater. Um, you haven't seen numbers like that uh, in her 20 years. And that she can, and that Goldberg uh, connects it to a campaign that goes from critiques of critical race theory to uh, purging school libraries of books that are um, that in concern race and gender. I'm just trying to move to my next slide. What is this? Okay. So when I think of mouse, I really uh, being banned. I think of it in the context of these of many, many, many other books that are being banned that have to do with uh, usually LGBTQ issues or um, non-white identities. And uh, so for a very long time, this has been going on and authors of color have been speaking out about this. And 
it perhaps it's just a matter of time but before um jews got targeted as well but um but not at all in to the degree of of other minority groups so the question is um why was mouse removed from the uh curriculum in McMinn County. So I'm going to very quickly just go over that. Uh, and these are remarks taken from the transcript of their minute of the school board's meeting, but due to profanity. And um, really, if you look at this closely, it's one person who articulated most of, of the reasons. And to my mind, had a lot of sway with the other people on this committee, including a two or three who were not uh, for removing mouse in the beginning. Um, but uh, things like the, that, that the son curses the father and, uh, and other language. There isn't very much, to my mind, objectionable language, but they really focused on that. Secondly, nudity and sexuality. So, um, and one thing that this individual points out is that it's not very explicit, but there's this moment when the son is talking to his father about when the father lost his virginity. So this is seen as, as problematic. And then nakedness. And so, uh, of course, that's naked mice. And also this, the one image you see here um, of, uh, Art Spiegelman's mother uh, who committed suicide, where there you see her breasts. Um, not really a very salacious image, but all right. Um, lastly, violence. So we see people hanging. Uh, someone said it shows uh, people killing kids. There's one image that you see on the left, um, but and uh, that's that. Um, and then uh, again, it seems like the image of uh, from um, the part of Mouse that incorporates an older comic that Art Spiegelman did, uh, Prisoner on the Hell Planet, that that one panel seems to be cited a lot. So um, this guy, Mike Cochran, also talks about uh, how the problem is that the entire curriculum is 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 um, I think I wrote develop, but it's uh, oh, it's developed to normalize sexuality, normalize nudity, normalize vul vulgar language. If I he says if I was trying to indoctrinate somebody's kids, this is how I would do it through this curriculum. And so they really need to look at the entire curriculum. I think that is the context in which Mouse is being. Uh, or what has been removed. And, and so I don't see it as a direct attack on Holocaust education so much as Holocaust education is getting swept up in this larger, pro really problematic movement that is um, trying to uh, you know, offer a version of American history uh, that is in their interests. So the question is, why teach mouse? And this is what I'll be focusing on. Uh, firstly, there's just that the accessibility of it, that because it's it's a graphic narrative, it has drawings, it's a comic, students will find it much more accessible. It's uh, secondly, a second generation account. So an account by a child of survivors that incorporates a survivor account and is not it's not a fictional account by someone born after the Holocaust, and so it represents the Holocaust as as a multi generational event that that exists historically. It exists as an ongoing memory, has after effects, and and so on. It's not a novel. Um, I think a problem with many novels that are used in Holocaust education is that in, they make the Holocaust a dramatic setting for events. And the events are often ahistorical and frequently involve a non-Jewish savior or a non-Jewish tragic figure. And I just feel like with novels written uh, by people with no direct experience, you get often the fantasies and investments of 
of the authors. Um, and the Holocaust kind of plays a part of lending dramatic heft to stories. And so it's not to say that there aren't good novels written um, after the Holocaust by people who weren't there, but to me, they are not the, the primary sources we should be going to for Holocaust education. Um, Mouse neither avoids the horror of the Holocaust nor identifies it in a kind of reductive way solely with Auschwitz. And so it's worth noting that Mouse one concludes uh, by reaching Auschwitz after 156 pages of, of depicting Jewish life and Jewish experience of um, persecution pre before um, Vladek uh, reaches Auschwitz. And, and so often um, the Holocaust becomes sort of in education, um, if, if students in schools are only getting one depiction of it, uh, it's, it's gonna be something that just uh, portrays like the camp or hiding, right, with Anne Frank and you never get out of hiding to see what's going on um, to Jews um, in hiding uh, out on the streets, in ghettos, in camps and so on. Uh, Fifth point is that Mouse depicts Jewish life before Nazi persecution and depicts um, cultural anti Semitism. So, anti Semitism is something that's not just um, Nazi uh, officers beating on uh, prisoners in camps, but something that is more culturally uh, um, permeating and affects people's lives. And, and it kind of moves from everyday life to the uh, extremity of the camp. So you get that full range in mouse, um, which is really important for, for realizing, you know, to, to, to see um, if the Holocaust is just the camps, then it's always something that has nothing, you know, there's nothing that about it that would, that we might relate to what's going on today. Um, Cause we'll say, well, it's not like there are death camps, right? Um, people aren't being gassed, but to, real, to, to take lessons from the Holocaust and apply them to today, you could um, look at kind of the, the persecution of minority groups um, in other ways. And then uh, my sixth point, and the one that I'll probably be touching on the most today is that Maus um, both discusses and portrays the complexity of telling about the Holocaust, of depicting the Holocaust, that um, how do we how do we represent what seems so unimaginable and, and horrific? Um, and how do we get our get our heads around it? That that becomes something that is thematized and and uh, depicted in Mouse itself. So to talk about that, and if if you attended this my, my talk last year, that's this will be familiar which I apologize, um, but um, to address that, I'm gonna talk about kind of three layers in mouse. Um, and I'm drawing a lot from Erin McLaughlin's uh, chapter on mouse in her book, Second Generation Holocaust Literature. So roughly uh, speaking, there are the three layers or levels in mouse. There's Vladek's story. So this is the father who is a Holocaust survivor. It's his story of uh, life bef before and during and just after the Holocaust. Then there's Artie's story, which is um, that about Artie getting his father's story from his father. And then um, and, and then also just negotiating life with his father. So a lot of this is a lot of mouse is about Artie's difficult relationship to his father. You get a depiction of the survivor in mouse that doesn't sanctify survivors and and doesn't make uh, doesn't represent the Holocaust as having been an education in how to be a good person, right? That persecution doesn't make people uh, wonderful people. It makes them persecuted. It makes it means they've suffered. Um, and a lot of what you see in mouse is that the things that allowed. Vladex to survive and that were great um, personality traits to have to survive the, the Holocaust 
um, although mostly he survived like any other survivor because of luck, that anyway, those things that served him so well maybe don't serve him so well in everyday life um, or make life very difficult for others. And then the third layer is art's commentary. And uh, so I'm distinguishing between art and Artie to, to, to make it easier to talk about, but that art's commentary is his commentary on making mouse. So the first uh, layer I'll talk about, Vladek's story, it goes from when Vladek's a bachelor in Chestahova in 1935 to his reunion with Anya um, uh, after, in 1945. And it's set in the past. And um, it's a story about death and survival in the ghetto, in hiding in Auschwitz and on the death march. Also, though, it's a story about living uh, about about Vladek's life before um, his his primary existence was trying to survive uh, persecution and the life of Anya and Anya's family. So you see, like Jews living, right? Your um, Polish Jews um, experiencing life. Then Artie's story it's set in the present. Right, not our present, but you know the the period when, from Artie's childhood to uh, briefly his childhood, but really the years when he's getting the story from Vladek, and the other main players besides Vladek are Artie's wife Francoise and his stepmother Maya. Um, it also involves Artie's uh, frustrated effort, right, unfulfilled effort to learn his mother Anya's story, and so. Um, I could just say another thing that students take away from Mouse is that you're getting one story, not you can't get one survivor story and think you have the story of the Holocaust, right? So Artie's always trying to just get his mother's story and can't. So built into the story that we get in um, in Mouse of a survivor is the kind of ghost story, the untold story of another person who survived. Um, until she committed suicide, which you know one could argue is also is is the lasting impact of the Holocaust. So Mouse was published in serial form in R Raw magazine that Spiegelman um, started um, from 1980 to 1991, so over 11 years, and then it, Mouse was published in two volumes. Um, in 1986 and 1991. So this allowed Spiegelman to incorporate into Mouse uh, two things, his ongoing reflection on creating Mouse and then his, his re response to its public reception. So both of these find expression in Mouse and give it this meta commentary or meta level of um, where he's talking about the book's reception in the book itself. So meta in the sense that it's it's commenting on itself. So we have this level of commentary. It's neither the present in which Vladek and Artie interact, nor the past of Vladek's story, but the place from which Art tells Vladek's story and Artie's story. So the question is like, what do we call that? If it's not the present and the past, what do we call it? Well, Spiegelman gives us a term for it. In an interview, uh, he said that there was, you know, this present with Vladek and me talking, and then there's the past with his story. And then all of a sudden when he, he uh, does um, the chapter called uh, Auschwitz Time Flies, and that's the first chapter in Mouse 2, he says, now we had a kind of super present. And to let you know that this isn't incidental, but that Spiegelman put a lot of thought into this and that this is part of the design of this, of this narrative. Uh, he says the super present was done with certain devices. For one thing, the upper and lowercase writing, because um, otherwise you just get like all caps, right? Which is traditional in comics. Um, and, the, and, the, um, and so it, he says, this implies that all of the upper and lowercase comes from a different perspective than what we're getting in CAP. So the, on the left, just I visited my father more often in order to get more information about his past than on another visit. But then we get that use of upper and lowercase handwriting actually in, 
in word balloons um, in the time flies chapter. And we'll get it elsewhere in the second part of mouse. So Spiegelman says the other indicator of the super president is that the masks are more obviously masks than ever before. The masks are masks of mice and what's obviously human beings wearing them. So um, when, when, uh, Artie, when Art goes to see his therapist, who's also a Holocaust survivor, that scene, they're both wearing masks. That scene's taking place uh, after Vladek uh, has died. So it's, in, it's not in the present, it's in the super present. So or this third level takes place in the super present. It's marked by these devices with the lettering and the masks. And also it's marked by um, other devices that call the reader's attention to mouse as a constructed text. It's when it kind of it breaks the fourth wall and we're aware that we're reading a comic. Um, so we have these three levels, but they don't simply exist side by side. They exist embedded one in the other. So at the deepest, so the biggest frame, right, the outermost frame is the super present of art talking about making mouse um, and, and us as readers being made aware that, you know, we're reading a, a, a comic or a graphic uh, narrative. Within that, that frames Artie's story of interviewing uh, Vladek and also just dealing his relationship with Vladek. That frames the story of Vladek's um, past. So what makes Mouse so rich and interesting, in addition to what I've said so far, is that there's all this border crossing between these different layers. The fancy word for that for narrative theorist types is metalepsis. Um, and we all know it. Like if you watched Bugs Bunny as a kid and saw um, a pencil enter into the frame and erase Daffy Duck, you've seen metalepsis. This crossing from the real world into the world of the, of the cartoon, supposedly. It always happens within the text, right? Um, it's not like someone is actually moving from reality into it, but there's a depiction of reality outside of the story world. So you get these layers. So I'm gonna show you first examples of movement between Artie's story and Vladek's story. Um, part of what makes these so interesting is it's like two-way traffic. In some cases you get the present moving into the past, sometimes the past moving into the present and sometimes both at the same time. So, here we have a layering of, of the past and the present. We have past speech in word balloons and past images. So these are images um, depicting Vladek's past and what went on. But we also have a superimposed present image of Vladek today and pre Vladek's present day speech, right? He, he's sort of, a, he's a narrator. He's saying, I was a lucky one. Everything fitted me a little, only the shirt was torn and too big for me. And then below that, uh, we see him in the shirt. We see him getting uh, his number tattooed on him. And then below that, uh, him showing this uh, tattoo in the present. So there's a more complicated version here. Um, another example. So we have the, the past speech and past images shown. We have the superimposed present image, like in the last example, uh, here of already uh, talking with Vladek and, um, and also in, in text boxes, uh, Vladek narrating the story he's telling. But then we get this weirdness of the um, of this image of uh, that's kind of grayed over of it's a repeat of the previous image, but now instead of a mouse, we see a cat. And it has to do with a prisoner who's saying, I don't deserve to be here. 
I'm a German, I'm not a Jew. And, and so um, Spiegelman gives us both, right? He first gives us this figure as a, a Jew and then raises the question, you know, like that already asked at the same time, was he really a German? And Vladek says, who knows? It was German prisoners also, but for the Germans, this guy was Jewish. And so um, Spiegelman found a really interesting way to, to depict this, but it, it also gets at a way that um, it gets the reader thinking about how whatever we see is always an approximation, right? That, that, that Vladek's not, knowledge is limited and then Erdi's interpreting what Vladek says and finding a visual way to represent it. And that um, it, everything's sort of an approximation to, it's our best effort to get at the truth, which is always somewhat elusive. And that's just the nature of life and of any representation of autobiographical experience. So, uh, then, Gary, yeah. just a quick question, it's Dave. Mm -hmm. um, somebody asked, they weren't aware that prisoners tattooed other prisoners, is that, <laughs> typically what would happen in, according to your knowledge? The, it seemed like yeah. the, one of the images before showed him getting tattooed by another prisoner. Yeah, prisoners would be functionaries who would do all of this, uh, the shaving, uh, every, you know, giving out clothes and so on. I mean, some, you know, like, like, like Primo uh, Levy talks about how like his encounter with, with guards in the camp was virtually nil, right? It's basically functionaries that you're prisoner functionaries that you're dealing with. Um, so yes. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, now I'm gonna talk about movement from the super present into the present and the past. And so we get, we see this in, in the moment from Time Flies where we have this really dramatic image of Art at his drawing easel with bodies that, that are iconic, right, from, from photographs taken by liberators. So the past appears as haunting Holocaust imagery in the super present. So we have the images from the past into the present, like out the window of the guard tower, right? It's it's all it's the icons that we know. Um, and the super present is less tied to realist conventions. Like we look at that, we don't really think that's going on there. We understand that this is a picture, this is a literalization of what's going on inside Art Spiegelman's head. Um, so the super present could be a mental space rather than a real space, or it can you know, combine aspects of both. Here, the super present moves into the present moment of the story where we have a scene where Art, um, where Artie is trying to decide how to draw Francoise, right? Because she's French, but she converted to Judaism. So what is she? How does he depict her? So this is like meta commentary, right? It pierces the illusion of an as if real world. At, at the same time, we pretend this is a real world with real people in it. And, but we also get the sense that like, uh, wait, this violates temporal logic. You know, uh, obviously Spiegelman already decided to depict Francoise as a mouse because she's a mouse, right, already. And if she's a mouse, then why would he be sitting there asking her, should I draw you as a mouse? And he would see she is a mouse, right? So anyway, it just, it shows as, as readers uh, how much we're willing to accept and kind of just go with it. And sort of, we understand the codes that Spiegelman is using, even though, uh, we probably understand them in a way that we wouldn't really know how to verbalize or be uh, self-aware of. We just kind of do it automatically. So what does the play of layers and mouse illustrate or make visible? Um, first, the ways that the narrated past, the present moment in which narration is going on, and then the moment in which the writer, speaker, artist creates the narrative are all entwined in Holocaust testimonies. This, this happens, I believe, in all Holocaust testimonies. If you look at At Night or, or Ruth Kluger Still Alive or, you know, or, or Levy or uh, Weissman Klein or any of these people, like that, these three levels are there. There's, there's you know, these moments, the past, 
the moment of narration within the story and then the moment in which the person's writing um, or speaking. Uh, Mouse makes that visible and in a way that you can then become aware of and then see it going on elsewhere where it's far less visible. Um, then uh, I think Mouse allows us to see the desire of people who, who were not there to kind of witness the Holocaust, the written and visual depictions that we, we wish we could witness it too, that we could bear witness to this. And so we expose ourselves to a lot of representations of it where we feel like other people should bear witness to this. So we assign them books on the Holocaust, like, like Mouse, um, and films and, and interviews and so on. Uh, this raises ethical questions, right? The limits of what can and can't be shown or represented and epistemological questions, the limits of what can and can't be known. And uh, I think Mouse, right? There's always this question of like, you know, you could see Spiegelman making decisions of how, how much violence can I show? Well, it's mice, it's cartoony, it's cats. That allows for a lot more because that's not realistic. But at the same time, he, he, he um, is, is tactful in certain ways, right? Um, and, uh, but not in a way that, that hides the fact that violence went on and people witnessed it. Uh, and then there's this the question of like with the example of was this prisoner a Jew or is he is he telling the truth he was German that the Vladic really can't know that um, there are a lot of things that you know uh, already Art Spiegelman could not know his, his mother's experiences because he could not get her diaries which she wrote about them she could not interview her about it and so that goes unrepresented. Um, Mouse also illustrates the survivor's difficult effort to recount the past in stories. Um, and the child of survivor's difficult effort to tell the family story, which gets at how the, the, the Holocaust has this ongoing traumatic impact. We see that when the past moves into the present. Um, we see that survivors are complex individuals as opposed to like the survivor like you can't read night and feel like you got this the the story of all survivors um although it's you know and some people teach it that way um this book will cover everything and then uh mouse also gets at how present day perspective and perspectives and interests shape the representation of the past like who vladek is at the time he's speaking to already represents how he talks about his story. Are Artie's in, interests, it, it, you know, influence what Vladek says? Because like Vladek begins, he says, Tell, begin when you met mama, right? He could have, Vladek could have begun when he was a child. He didn't because Artie said, begin when you met mama. And when he goes a little bit before that to talk about like a woman he knew before Artie's mother, mama, it's like a shock to him. Um, so it's like a negotiation between, it's a discussion, right? Um, how the story is going to get told. And survivor testimony is always a negotiation between the audience and the teller. So, and then uh, that Holocaust testimony is always partial and unfinished, right? We never get the complete full story. It, we're, we, it, it's an ongoing act of communication. And so ev everything's like the best we can get. It's, it's a compromise. Um, not just true of the Holocaust, true of any past experience, you know, event, trying to get your family's history, trying to get the history of segregation, trying to get the history of American slavery, whatever. Um, and then um, Mouse illustrates the absence of a redemptive or happy ending, which I think is really important because, uh, you know, part of, you know, Spiegelman's response to the minutes of, uh, uh, of the county board meeting was, I think they wanted a happier Holocaust. Right, like they wanted a more feel-good Holocaust, uh, and they're definitely ones that are available. Right, so uh, the uh, the truth is, you know, the Holocaust doesn't have redemptive or, or a happy uh, a redemptive or happy ending. Right, um, it's about death and persecution and uh, trauma. So um, the 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 most productive thing is the the ability to to tell it and pass it on and learn from it. So that's what I, that's the end of my presentation. And what I thought we'd do next is, is look at um, 
at a, a page. So, I mean, I could, we could take questions now, but I feel like we'll never get to that page. So part of it has to do with time, but we could, Dave, what do you think is a better idea? I mean, just want to pose these questions to the group and see if anybody wants to answer, spend a few sure. minutes doing that, and then we can move into some questions. So is the page available in the chat right now? So it's still there. So if everybody just scrolls right. to the top of the chat box, this document mm -hmm. is there, but it's pretty easy to see as well um, mm -hmm. here on, on the screen as well. I can see so it on my screen, but if, if you want a better mm -hmm. look at it, everybody, you can scroll up to the top. There's a PDF of this page. So, so the, the question, so this is a moment from uh, mouse one, page 149. And, and I ask like, what is, and, the significance of including this moment in a book about the Holocaust. Uh, you know, I ask that this is not a moment you're gonna get in the diary of Anne Frank or a memoir that's about the camps, right? That it, it's something I think that Mouse is, is valuable for offering. Uh, what notable decisions did Spiegelman make in depicting this moment from Vladek's story? How could you re? How do you observe kind of the play of layers going on in this, and how it contributes to the impact of of the story? Um, those are my questions about it. I also, I mean, I do have some closer up views of this. It's great. I don't know if you can see the questions, but there's. Oh some, no! Um, oh, could you chat. do the calling one, folks? Yeah, sure. Um, there's questions about the pig mask and. Are the Germans deliberately wearing a pig mask? Um, are the Germans deliberately painted as pigs? So there, there's a lot of questions about pig masks. And then and then we'll get to Mark's question as well. He has his, his hands up. So there's a lot of like wondering what's going on with the pig masks. Yep. Well, there's a good reason they're pigs and not cats, right? Because they're not they're not Germans. These are Poles, right? So um so in mouse. Germans are depicted as cats and Poles are depicted as pigs and Jews as mice. So this is, but, but the, I think that what those responses get at is just, you know, this assumption, if, if there's anti-Semitism, those are Germans, right? Whereas these are, these are Poles. Great. Mark Gilbert, you had a, you had a question as well, if you wanted to unmute. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> I've always I found this page interesting where um, so I, I've, I've taught mouse for the last eight years to my my middle school students. And, and what I've always found was what, while he wears the mask and disguises himself as as a pole, uh, he gets away pretty easily as a pole. He says he's a pole by wearing the mask. And we see that. But in this page, um, even though he, he isn't outwardly showing he's wearing the mask to show. Uh, the kids can outwardly show, like, call him out that he, they know that he isn't. Um, and I find this seems to be one of the, the few places where he, he's wearing a mask, hiding his identity as a Jew and instead pretending that he's a Pole. Um, but it, it doesn't work. That's yeah. interesting. There, there's a question. I'll, thank you, Mark. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, it, uh, somebody had the question, Gary, um, why are the poles depicted as pigs? Why did he choose pigs to depict poles? And I'm sure that's a question that must come up in classrooms also. Right. I think, you know, I think it would, it would be, I, uh, I'm sure that there's a quote I could, one could find from Spiegelman, but I think it's like, you know, it's the, it's the difference in you, Jews living in Poland for, for hundreds of years, and a, and a big marker of difference is being kosher or not, you know, keeping kosher or not keeping kosher. So I think that's part of uh, is probably what's behind that decision. Um, and uh, I, I would just say that also to, to get at what Mark Mark's comment is that uh, Anya is Anya. You know, Vladik would say Anya looks more Jewish than he does, right? So he could get away. I mean, you see this in other accounts as well, um, that there'll be a child who's darker, right? Darker hair, and then someone else who's lighter skinned, maybe blonde or red haired, right? And that they could pass. Um, and that um, the, the darker 
uh, in person couldn't. And so there's actually, there's another page uh, where uh, Vladek and Anya are both walking uh, and uh, with and, and they're drawn with the pig masks, but you see a long mouse tail coming up from Anya. And it's, it's Spiegelman's way of saying like, she's less able to carry this off. There's also this, sometimes you see um, in survivor accounts uh, mention of like, you know, we could fool Germans, but we couldn't fool Poles. Like Poles could sniff out Jews in a way because they lived next to Jews uh, and Polish Jews, you know, for so long. Uh, and I, I see this as a version of that, which is like, you could fool adults who are just gonna logically think, hey, if someone's walking around, you know, that can't be a Jew because that person would be hiding from us, but you can't fool children, right? Like children just see what's right in front of their eyes. Um, I should say that there's, you know, so there's, there's polls in this who, uh, you know, including adults who scream, oh, there's a Jew, right? And then others who know, who hide, like there's, there's a, a, a poll who hides them, right? So you get positive and negative depictions of polls in mouse. But an overall an overall depiction of the culture as being anti-Semitic. And then the fact that some people are not anti-Semitic within that becomes noteworthy. Other comments or questions? Yes. Uh, um, <clears throat> there are uh, Tim asked. <laughs> Um, and I'll get to you in a second, Peter, sorry. Um, Tim asked, um, did he ever, have you ever interacted with, with Art Spiegelman or hear him speak? What was the impact? Um, I did, when he gave a, a not in person in, a, you know, Gratz had, a, had sponsored hit a talk he gave. So I watched that and I sort of, and I saw him in his talking in his studio. That's the, you know, I got to ask a question. That's, that's the extent of my interaction with him. Well, yeah, we, we had the program here at Grants, yep. Yeah, this is wonderful. Um, so there is um, a book, MetaMouse, right? That's a huge book and it also has a, a CD in it uh, or DVD with, um, a, a whole bunch of, of archival uh, material that he used to make mouse and very long interviews with Spiegelman. So your access to, to what Spiegelman was thinking and to actually see his process is tremendous because he's basically published his archive um, and interviews with him. So that would be like another layer, right? Outside of mouse that you could, another textual layer you could go to. But I, I, you know, my, my impression is when I, when I hear him speak or read more of his commentary is, is, is to just be more impressed, I guess, mm -hmm. and, and feel like it, it, he endless, endlessly enriches uh, Mouse. Uh, there's a, so Peter, I'm sorry, you had a question. Oh, you just went away though on my screen. Oh no, I was just lowering my hand. Okay, did you still want to ask a question or? Um, I mean, I just wanted to comment like this, this page, this part of mouse, I've taught this to my ninth grade students before. Um, and one of the things they always like to point out is the children kind of diming out or snitching out Vladek. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and they think, you know, they thought that that was like one of the most interesting things. We usually end up having a really deep conversation about that um, and leading that into a conversation of education and what kids are taught and what kids from different cultures are taught at this time period. Um, and it kind of ties back into that generational, um, that generational trauma, and that generational um, passing of the torch of these stories and, and of, you know, the education. Um, Vladek, you know, present Vladek in his, you know, uh, hat and his glasses is right in the center of the page, just kind of interrupting this whole interaction. Um, and with what you mentioned about the layers, like I see it now with the different speeches, well, the different text in the different placements on the page. Um, there's a lot of layers working in here um, and it's just one page of the book, but there is, there's a lot going on. Um, I just wanted to comment on that. Those okay. are great comments. 
if I could quickly say, it just it made you made me think of the boy in the striped pajamas, which uh, to me operates with this cultural myth that children are just kind of naturally innocent and righteous, and that you know until they encounter, you know, kind of the adult world, and and this is just showing. You know, and so that this child in that book is somehow grew up somehow not in a culture that just taught him anti-Semitism from the youngest age, somehow evaded all that, uh, so that he could have this magical experience of encountering a Jewish kid in a death camp. Um, which I find that book so problematic. Uh here, like children, right? I mean, they, it's not like these children are evil, they just are products of their culture, like they're children are cultured right like they're 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 culturally shaped um so so there's an interesting question that i'm gonna from gail um hi gail who i i know from a past life but i'm gonna um i'm gonna rework the question just a little bit gary and you know getting back to teaching this this graphic memoir as you call it mm -hmm. um you you know i'm assuming there's a lot of teachers we've already heard from a couple of them on this call and you're teaching this book to young people who what I would assume if you're in a public school are predominantly not Jewish. And the question is, is how much of the cultural aspects of Judaism, right? Like the idea of pigs and being kosher and being in Poland and what all of that means, how much of that background, and it happens throughout the book, right? There's, there's all sorts of references, um, both in those layers and, and up front. how much of that do teachers need to teach? Uh, do they have to encounter it in order to make the book work? Um, and I don't know if there's some teachers on here who wanna respond or if you have some ideas, hopefully that made sense the way I phrased that. Um, but really just looking at how do you get, you know, as a Jewish person who is a, you know, second generation, um, you know, from survivors, I understand, you know, the cultural piece is easy. Um, but for, for people who've never spoken to somebody or, or have any idea, it might be more difficult. So what do you do in that case? Or how is that handled? I mean, I'll be interested to hear what other people say. I mean, my, my thought is that what one needs to know is sort of bit built into the book by Spiegelman. Um, and that I, I feel like there's enough, you know, when he, he talks about, very, he has, he explains certain things that come up, uh, like uh, when Vladik has a dream about the day he'll be get out of the camp and what, what day was this? Is this part of a Torah read? It, it's explained to readers. Um, I think I don't don't want to err on the side of make of, of making uh, European Jews um, seem otherworldly and and and. Uh, so, sort of exotically other. Um, and I think Mouse does so much to, 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 to try to get at a kind of shared humanity. Um, at the same time, there is this part where Vladek says we were very religious. And I thought, oh, I kind of, you know, there's a way you cannot get that. I think that Spiegelman doesn't uh, maybe he doesn't feel, he doesn't seem to have been raised that religiously, right? And so maybe he didn't fully get it and didn't fully represent it. So I, I, I think it, it really for you as a teacher, it depends on how, what, how much you want to add to what's in, in the book. Um, my, my mindset, I must admit, is more about counteracting, I think, stereotype students would bring as opposed to feeling like I need to add to this whole kind of explanation of Judaism. Um, but others, you know, it depends what it is you primarily want students to learn from Maus. Great, Gail, yeah, hopefully that answered your question wherever you are on the screen. Um, and hopefully that, um, <clears throat> and, and, and Gail followed up with, she's just hoping she doesn't miss anything, right? There's no subtle nuances. And I think what, what Gary's really saying is that there aren't any, right? That it's pretty, it's pretty clear um, when reading it, and it, it doesn't leave a lot of questions, and it, it might be the other way around, where it's kind of getting rid of some of those stereotypes. So, um, a good question and something to keep in mind as as we're teaching uh, this memoir. So, I have a handout from Lizette. If I said that correctly, I hope. 
Mm. You did, thank you. Um, I just wanted to respond to um, that question because I think that a lot of the details really have to do with where you're teaching um, mm -hmm. and how much your students want to know. Um, for instance, um, I, because of where I live, um, we border a community that is um, Hasidic. Um, so our students know very little and they think they know a lot. So by introducing something like this and allowing them to ask those questions and give them a better understanding of what these traditions are and what they mean, um, I think we would do our students a huge service um, because again, they think they know it all, but they really don't know much about the Jewish community. Yeah, and it provides opportunities yeah. to maybe learn more, right? And you know, if, there, if these questions do come up for you or any of your students to, to go look at that and look at those questions and find those answers, it's a great learning opportunity um, beyond just you know, survivor testimony, Holocaust, right? All the things that Gary's been talking about. Um, so we're just about at, um, at our time. Um, so if there are any other quick mm -hmm. questions that we can get to, let us know. Um, we can also feel free to email me. So it's D Malter. I'll put it in the chat, um, and I can I can help facilitate getting some of your questions answered. Um, so I I want to say thank you very very much to Gary. Um, we approached him just not too long ago. Um, the program was recorded. We will be sending it out to everybody um, who registered tonight. Edit. We're gonna do a little bit of editing first. Um, we will be sending it out to everybody who signed up, so you'll be able to look at it. Um, in the chat before you leave, um, I am going to put, well, hold on, I need to put my email in. And I'm also gonna put a quick survey. Uh, if you wouldn't mind filling out that survey when you have the opportunity, that link will also be in the email that you get up. We'd love to make sure that the program we're doing is helpful, useful, um, making the, meeting the mark. Um, so thanks again to Gary for taking the time for joining us yet again. Uh, this was really wonderful. We're always very happy to have you um, and appreciate your insight. We appreciate all of you coming and your participation and your great questions as well. Um, it was a great conversation. Um, I also wanna thank everyone who helped make this possible, especially Naomi Hausman, Lori Cohen, and Mindy Cohen, who's somewhere on this call. Thanks also to Suzette who, uh, for her behind the scenes wizardry on Zoom, uh, keeping us all calm and all of this working. So I wanna say, enjoy the rest of your evening. Um, on behalf of Gratz, we hope to see you again at one of our programs soon and let us know if we can answer any questions. I'll stick around for just a few minutes to, to answer any other questions. Uh, hopefully Gary can as well, not to impede on his time, uh, but thank you all again. Uh, stay safe. If you're in Philadelphia, stay dry and uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Thank you again.